Section 29 of Rudder Grange. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rudder Grange by Frank R. Stockton. Chapter 15. In which two new friends disport themselves. Part 1. The next morning was fine and nice, continued Pomona, and after our breakfast had been brought to us, we went out in the gardens to take a walk. There was lots of trees back of the house, with walks among them, and altogether it was so old-timey and castle-ish that I was happy as a lark. "'Come along, Earl Miguel,' I says. "'Let us tread a measure neath these mantlin trees.' "'All right,' says he. "'Your Jigel attends you. And what might our noble second name be? What is we Earl and Earless of?' "'Oh, anything,' says I. "'Let's take any name at random.' "'All right,' says he. "'Let it be random. Earl and Earless random. Come along.' So we walks about, I feelin' mighty noble and springy, and afore long we sees another couple a-walkin' about under the trees. Who's them? says I. Don't know, says he, but I expect there's some of the other boarders. The man said he had other boarders when I spoke to him about takin' us. Let's make believe they're a count and countess, I says. Count and countess of Milwaukee, says he. I didn't think much of this for a noble name, but still it would do well enough and so we called him the Count and Countess of Milwaukee, and we kept on a mirandering. Pretty soon he gets tired, and says he was a-going back to the house to have a smoke, because he thought it was time to have a little fun, which weren't all imaginations, and I says to him to go along, that it would be the hardest thing in this world for me to imagine any fun in smoking. He laughed and went back, while I walked on, a making a believe a page, in puffed blue breeches, was a-holdin' up my train, which was of light green velvet trimmed with silver lace. Pretty soon, turning a little corner, I met the Count and Countess of Milwaukee. She was a small lady dressed in black, and he was a big fat man about fifty years old, with a grayish beard. They both wore little straw hats, exactly alike, and had on green carpet slippers. They stops when they sees me, and the lady, she bows and says, Good morning, and then she smiles very pleasant, and asks if I was a-livin' here, and when I said I was, she said she was, too, for the present, and what was my name. I had half a mind to say the earless random, but she was so pleasant and sociable that I didn't like to seem to be making fun, so I said I was Mrs. de Henderson. And I, says she, am Mrs. General Andrew Jackson, widow of the ex-president of the United States. I am staying here on business connected with the United States Bank. This is my brother, says she, pointing to the big man. "'How do you do?' says he, a-putting his hands together, turning his toes out and making a funny little bow. "'I am General Tom Thumb,' he says in a deep, gruff voice, "'and I've been before all the crowned heads of Europe, Asia, Africa, America, and Australia, all ads but one, and I'm a-waitin' here for a team of four little milk-white oxen, no bigger than tall cats, which is to be hitched to a little hay-wagon, which I am to ride in with a little pitchfork and real farmer's clothes only small.' This will come to-morrow, when I will pay for it and ride away to exhibit. It may be here now, and I will go and see. Good-bye. Good-bye, likewise, says the lady. I hope you'll have all your thinking you're having, and more, too, but less if you'd like it. Farewell, and away they goes. Well, you may be sure I stood there amazed enough, and mad, too, when I heard her talk about my being all I was a-thinking I was. I was sure my husband, scarce two weeks old a husband, had told all. It was bad. I just wished I'd said I was the earless of random and brassed it out. I rushed back and found him smoking a pipe on the back porch. I charged him with his perfidy, but he vowed so earnest that he had not told those people of our fantasies, or had ever spoke to him, that I had to believe him. I expect, says he, that they're just making believe as we are. There ain't no patent on make-believes. This didn't satisfy me, and as he seemed to be so careless about it, I walked away and left him to his pipe. I determined to go take a long walk along some of the country roads and think this thing over for myself. I went around to the front gate, where the woman of the house was a-standin' talkin' to somebody, and I just bowed to her, for I didn't feel like saying anything, and walked past her. Hello, said she, jumpin' in front of me and shuttin' the gate. You can't go out there. If you want to walk, you can walk about in the grounds. There's lots of shady paths. Can't go out, says I. Can't go out. What do you mean by that? I mean just what I say, says she, and she locked the gate. I was so mad that I could have pushed her over and broke the gate, but I thought that if there was anything of that kind to do, I had a husband whose business it was to attend to it, 
and so I runs around to him to tell him. He had gone in, but I met Mrs. Jackson and her brother. "'What's the matter?' said she, seeing what a hurry I was in. "'That woman at the gate,' I said, almost choking as I spoke, "'won't let me out.' "'She won't,' said Mrs. Jackson. "'Well, that's the way she has. Four times the Bank of the United States has closed its doors before I was able to get there, on account of that woman's obstinacy about the gate. Indeed, I have not been to the bank at all yet, for of course it is of no use to go after banking hours. And I believe, too, said her brother in his heavy voice, that she has kept out my little team of oxen. Otherwise it would be here now. I couldn't stand any more of this, and ran to our room where my husband was. When I told him what had happened, he was real sorry. I didn't know you thought of going out, he said, or I would have told you all about it. And now sit down and quiet yourself, and I'll just tell you how things is. So down we sits, and just he, just as calm as a summer day, says, My dear, this is a lunatic asylum. Now don't jump, he says. I didn't bring you here because I thought you was crazy, but because I wanted you to see what kind of people they was who imagined themselves earl and earlesses, and all sort of things, and to have an idea how the thing worked after you'd been doing it a good while and had got used to it. I thought it would be a good thing, while I was Earl Jigail and you was a noble earless, to come to a place where people acted that way. I knowed you had read lots of books about knights and princes and bloody towers, and that you knowed all about them things, but I didn't suppose you did know how them same things looked in these days, and a lunatic asylum was the only place where you could see em. So I went to a doctor I knowed, he says, and got a certificate from him to this private institution, where we could stay for a while and get posted on romantics. Then, says I, the upshot was that you wanted to teach a lesson. Just that, says he. All right, says I, it's teached. And now let us get out of this as quick as we can. That'll suit me, he says, and we'll leave by the noon train. I'll go and see about the trunk being set down. So off he went to see the man who kept the house, while I falls to packing up the trunk as fast as I could. Weren't you dreadfully angry at him? asked Euphemia, who, having a romantic streak in her own composition, did not sympathize altogether with this heroic remedy for Pomona's disease. No, ma'am, said Pomona, not long. When I thought of Mrs. General Jackson and Tom Thumb, I couldn't help thinking that I must have looked pretty much the same to my husband, who I knowed now had only been making believe to make believe. And besides, I couldn't be angry very long for laughing when he came back in a minute, as mad as a March hare, and said they wouldn't let me out nor him nother, I fell to laughing ready to crack my sides. They say, said he, as soon as he could speak straight, that we can't go out without another certificate from the doctor. I told him I'd go myself and see about it, but they said no, I couldn't, for if they did that way, everybody who was ever sent here would be going out the next day to see about leaving. I didn't want to make no fuss, so I told them I'd write a letter to the doctor and tell him to send an order that would soon show them whether we could go out or not. They said that would be the best thing to do, and so I'm going to write it this minute, which he did. How long will we have to wait, says I, when the letter was done? Well, says he, the doctor can't get this before tomorrow morning, and even if he answers right away, we won't get our order to go out until the next day. So we'll just have to grin and bear it for a day and a half. This is a lively old bridal trip, said I, dry falls and a lunatic asylum. We'll try to make the rest of it better, said he. But the next day wasn't no better. We stayed in our room all day, for we didn't care to meet Mrs. Jackson and her crazy brother, and I'm sure we didn't want to see the mean creatures who kept the house. We knew well enough that they only wanted us to say so that they could get some more board money out of us. I should have broken out, cried Euphemia. I would never have stayed an hour in that place after I found out what it was, especially on a bridal trip. If we'd done that, said Pomona, they'd have got men after us, and then everybody would have thought we was real crazy. We made up our minds to wait for the doctor's letter, but it wasn't much fun, and I didn't tell no romantic stories to fill up this time. We sat down and behaved like the commonest kind of people. You never saw anybody sicker of romantics than I was when I thought of them two loons that called themselves Mrs. Andrew Jackson and General Tom Thumb. I dropped Miguel altogether, and he dropped Jigel, which was a relief to me, and I took strong to Jonas, even calling him Joan, which I consider a good deal uglier and commoner even than Jonas. He didn't like this much, but said that if it would help me out of the Miguel, he didn't care. End of section 29